This audiobook is produced by the Catholic Bishops Conference of England and Wales in partnership with the Catholic Truth Society. Welcome to CTS Audio, where faith comes through listening. Titus Brandsma by Hugh Clark Introduction It was about six o'clock on the evening of the 19th of January 1942. Two men knocked on the door of the Carmelite Priory in Niemingen, Holland, and asked for Father Titus Brandsma. After a long conversation conducted in German, Titus led one of the two men to his room, where they were found by the prior of the house. This gentleman of the Sickerheights Polizei has come to arrest me, explained Titus. He knelt down before his young superior and asked for a blessing. Changing his brown habit for a black suit, Titus followed his visitors to a waiting car, which carried them to the railway station to catch the 6.35pm train to Arnhem. That night, Titus rested on a straw mattress in a prison cell. He did not sleep. The following morning he was taken by train to The Hague. He was on his way to the concentration camp of Dachau. Early Years Anno Sierd Brandsma was born on the 23rd of February 1881 on a large farm at Ergerkloster in Frisia, a province in the north of Holland. Cut off from the rest of the country by lakes and rivers, Frisian Catholics had always maintained a spirit of independence and resilience to new ideas. The Brandsma family had shown themselves wholehearted and active Catholics. Titus, as Anno was to call himself when he entered the Carmelite order, took pride in his ancestry. I have the privilege of coming from a family in which one lived warmly with everything that advanced the cause of Frisian Catholics. The family consisted of four girls and two boys, all of whom except one were destined for the religious life. Theirs was a busy farm life in the days when butter and cheese were still made on the farm itself. At school, Anno showed himself intelligent and lively, yet with an independence which foreshadowed his future career. Apparently it was the custom when boys stayed behind for French lessons to share sweets with one another, on one occasion, Anno decided to break with this tradition. Promptly he was grabbed and held under the village pump. Anno made his first Holy Communion at 11, the usual age at that time, on the 4th of May 1892. Just before he had intimated to his parents that he wished to become a priest, as did his brother a little later. His mother and father accepted their decision, even though it meant that they would be deprived of their help on the farm and would have to provide for their education for an extra six years. Anno left the farm in September of that year for the junior seminary at Megan, in the southern province of Brabant, conducted by the Franciscans. He made good progress with his studies, being especially interested in history and literature. A good mixer, he showed himself of independent mind and was well liked by his classmates. Small in stature, Anno's health gave some cause for alarm, but the holidays spent on the farm soon restored him so that he was able to continue his studies. During his last year at the college, he began to think about the religious life. One of the Franciscans had told him, you're too clever to become a Jesuit. In fact, neither of these religious families attracted him. He turned towards the Carmelite order whose spirituality drew him, their spirit of prayer and special devotion to Mary, the Mother of God, whose scapula they wore. In September 1898, after the long summer holiday, Anno made his way to Boxmere, where he entered the Carmelite novitiate, taking the name of Titus at his clothing with the Carmelite habit. Novice and Student Seventeen years of age, good-looking and small in stature, Titus began his novitiate. 
The Carmel which he entered had been opened in 1653. It was a forbidding building, and the novitiate at that time was austere. The day began at 5.30am and ended at 8pm. Divine office, mass, meditation, spiritual reading, study, manual labour and lectures on the Carmelite rule and way of life filled most of the day, and the novices rose in the middle of the night to recite the office of matins. They were frequently moved from room to room. The heating was inadequate for the cold winters, which were not dissimilar from those experienced in the south of England. Here at Boxmere, Titus, with his five companions in the novitiate, strove to acquire the true spirit of Carmel, the spirit of the great Old Testament prophet Elijah, and of Mary, queen and beauty of Carmel. Life was not easy, but Titus assured his mother when writing to her for her birthday in October 1898 that he had settled down well and asked for prayers that he might seek only the will of God. Those who knew him used the word ardent to describe his attitude during this period. But at the same time, he showed himself calm and self-composed. On the 3rd of October 1899, Titus made his first profession but he remained in the novitiate for another year, as was then the custom. A little later, the novitiate was reduced to one year. In the following September, he began his study of philosophy. During this time, he had plenty of opportunity to study the lives of the saints, especially those of Carmel. From this time dates his great love for St. Teresa of Avila, the Carmelites who reformed the order in the 16th century. In 1900, still only a student, he published his anthology drawn from the works of St. Teresa. In 1901, the Carmelite priest, Dr. Hubertus Driessen, was appointed to teach philosophy at Boxmere. He was to have a great influence on Titus's future. At the very beginning of the course, a problem arose because of the professor's Latin pronunciation. None of the students could understand him. Titus offered to act as mediator. The result was that Dr. Hubertus, who took the intervention in good part, agreed to write out his lectures, which Titus would then distribute among the students. One important result was that Titus got to know the doctor very well. He wrote to Titus later, Such readiness to be of help to others made a deep impression on me, and not only on me, but on all who had contact with you. Towards the end of December 1901, Titus suffered a hemorrhage. He was confined for many weeks to his cell and forbidden to study, although later in the year his health improved and he was successful in his final exams. During the time of ill health, he was allowed visitors, among whom was Dr Hubertus. Titus wrote in an album presented to Dr Hubertus on the occasion of his Golden Jubilee. In those brief moments... You told me now this and then that about your Roman days, about your trials and difficulties, about your occasionally bold opposition to what you thought to be wrong, not to make me bitter, that you never did, but to make me see that something had to be done and could be done. There is always a turning point. The Lord does not wish things to remain always the same. There are moments in time when people must come forward who are willing and able to change them, not in a spirit of rebellion, but from a genuine love of the order and its continued development. Titus was gradually maturing. He came to understand the greatness of his order, its worldwide nature. But he also saw that there must be differences of opinion and conflicting views, as in any family. He was being prepared for his own apostolate in the Carmelite order and in the world. In September 1902, Titus left Boxmere for Zenderen to begin the four-year course in theology. After one year at Zenderen and two years at Oss, he was ordained a priest on the 17th of June 1905. A year later, he completed his course. The general view was that he was destined for higher studies in Rome, but his independence of mind had alienated his professor, 
Dr. Eugenius Driesen, Hubertus's brother. He vetoed the move. Titus was deeply disappointed, but made no complaint. The return of Hubertus to Holland, however, led to the breaking down of opposition. Titus made his own position quite clear. He could not accept without question everything he was told, nor could he expect others to do so. Speaking to his provincial, he said, You know what an independent mind I have. His provincial replied, That is precisely why you should go to Rome, so that you can study philosophy better. Like many others, Titus fell in love with Rome. He stayed at St Albert's College, later to become the Order's International College, where he found himself in contact with Carmelites from all over the world. He studied at the Gregorian University not only philosophy, but also physics, which included geometry, mathematics, physiology and astronomy. He was not satisfied with this and was allowed to follow a course in sociology too. This proved of major importance since it made him aware of the enormous possibilities open for priests and others to make their mark in bringing Christianity into the centre of national life. His health, however, was not good, and especially in his third and final year, he lost many months of study. At the first attempt, he failed the examinations for his doctorate. Nevertheless, he had been appointed as teacher of philosophy at Oss. In October 1909, he returned to Rome, receiving his Doctorate of Divinity. He was 28. Professor and Journalist Sent to teach philosophy to the Dutch Carmelite students at Oss, Titus did not limit himself to this work. He was continually asked to undertake a variety of activities, all of which brought into the open his efficiency and his tact. His first venture was in the realm of journalism, with the publication of Carmel Rosen, a magazine dedicated to the Mother of God and intended to make Carmel better known to the general public. Within a year of publication, there were already 11,000 subscribers. In 1916, he began to think of extending his earlier work on St. Teresa of Avila, a project which proved very successful and eventually involved the translation of all her works into Dutch in seven volumes. Titus himself was responsible for the first publication, her autobiography in 1918. By 1936, three other parts had appeared, and the work was completed after the Second World War. Titus also became involved in furthering the revival of Frisian culture and language. In 1919, he was asked to become the editor of the local paper, which was in danger of collapse, and in the same year, he was responsible for the setting up of a local library. In addition, he had been elected in 1909 to the Carmelite Definitory, the body which advised the Carmelite Provincial, and he remained a member for most of the rest of his life. During this period... Titus was still at his desk at half past one in the morning, even though at 6.30am he would be offering mass and in school at 8am. From its beginnings on Mount Carmel at the beginning of the 13th century, the Carmelite order has always striven to combine contemplation with the apostolate. Although at times this has been difficult, Titus once said, Inevitably, in almost all the circumstances of modern life, the active apostolate makes its great demands on Carmel. This activity must be rooted in contemplation, since this is its source and warrant of fruitfulness. Apostle for Christ The love of Christ urges me on. These words of the Apostle Paul characterised the activity of Titus Brandsmer during the years between the First and Second World Wars. Appointed teacher of philosophy at the New Catholic University of Niemingen in 1923, he not only took the academic side of his work seriously, but was keenly interested in the students themselves. The student friars of those days recalled that his interest in them was not something passing, 
but genuine, personal and all-embracing. It extended beyond our studies. He often joined us and showed an interest in our hobbies. He became known as Ons Profka, our little professor. His was an open door for all and sundry. His housekeeper at times expressed her worry and wanted to stop visitors. But Titus replied, But it would be sure to be the one who really needed my help. You'd better let him in. His interests ranged far and wide. The establishment of a shrine to St Boniface at Dockham in Frisia, where the saint had been murdered, and the Stations of the Cross there for which he wrote some meditations while under arrest. The planning of a definitive history of Frisian mysticism, the expansion of university life, the rebuilding of the Carmelite church in Mainz, the opening of a Carmelite house in Niemingen itself, of which he became the first prior, the arranging of a series of important lectures on mysticism, the preparation of the first National Marian Congress and pilgrimage in 1932. His appointment as Rector Magnificus of the University of Nimingen for the academic year 1932 to 1933, which he opened with an address on the concept of God, which aroused enormous interest both in and outside the order. His researches and lectures on mysticism, which led him to France, Italy, Spain, Germany and the United States of America, where he spoke eloquently on Carmelite mysticism. His appointment in 1935 by the Dutch hierarchy as national spiritual advisor to Catholic journalists. His apostolate for the reunion of Christendom, and so much more. Father Malachy Lynch, remembered in England as the well-beloved prior of the friars Aylesford, had vivid memories of Titus and his tireless industry. It was so quietly done, so naturally that one might easily have overlooked it. He was a great example of a priest, fully alive with a sense of cheerful urgency. Father Malachy recalled that his most vivid memory of Titus was of him sitting behind his typewriter, puffing happily at a cigar. Titus frequently smoked cigars. Cigars in Holland are as commonplace as cigarettes in England, or his pipe. The greater his concentration, the more he smoked. The Carmelite Elijah was above all the great contemplative, but God called him many times from his contemplation to the active life, and his place in the history of Israel is as one of its most untiring labourers. He always returned to the solitude of the life of contemplation. So the Carmelites must be contemplatives, who from their active life always return to contemplation as to the higher and better part of their vocation. So spoke Titus in his lectures on Carmelite mysticism at the Catholic University of Washington on 16th of July 1935. For him, the life of Elijah is the shortest summary of the order's life. Titus not only spoke about Carmelite mysticism, but lived it. Unfortunately, he was extremely reticent about his own personal spiritual life, and we only rarely get a glimpse of it. Although he enjoyed travelling, he had a season ticket on the trains, he preferred to be in Carmel. In prayer, he gave the impression of being perfectly calm and absorbed in God. On one occasion, he said to his audience, God, who lives in us and in whom we live and move and have our being, does not always hide. Sometimes he replaces the image by the reality, the imagination by the conscious experience. In Holland too he has done so. It is not unlikely that he was referring to his own experience. Whenever possible, he would be in choir at 5.30 each morning for meditation. He was determined to live the Carmelite rule as fully as possible. The divine office was a tonic for him, reviving his strength. When entering the chapel, he seemed to leave behind all his worldly activities and became absorbed in his worship, 
so much so that at times his voice resounded too loudly, and this had to be pointed out to him. At one time, there was a discussion in the definitory about exempting the student friars from the office. Titus reacted strongly. If that is going to be tabled in the definitory, I shall speak out against it with all available energy. If there is anyone who has grounds for exemption, it is me, and I won't dream of it. At the same time, he was consistently practical and realistic. If the friars could work better in more adequately heated rooms, they must have them. That was no luxury. Nor was the provision of periodicals and books. Visitors were welcome and were offered cigars and tea. While he was the most zealous in the keeping of the Carmelite rule, he never allowed this observance to become mere routine for that could be an obstacle to union with God. Titus would not have been a true Carmelite if he did not have a tender yet genuine love for the mother of Carmel. He thought and spoke of Mary with a deep love, recognising that in God's plan of redemption, Jesus and Mary could not be separated. In his book, The Beauty of Carmel, based on his lectures at Washington in 1935, he wrote, The mystery of the Incarnation has revealed to us how valuable man is to God, how intimately God wants to be united to man. This wonder draws one's attention to the eternal birth of the Son from the Father as the deepest reason for the mystery of love. The contemplation of the mystery has led to a twofold devotion to Mary, which we had better describe as an imitation gradually deepening into a close union with her. One should not think of the imitation without thinking of the union, nor of the union without the thought of the imitation. For this reason, he loved to wear the white cloak of Carmel, signifying as it does the maternal protection of Mary, referring to her title of Theotokos, God-bearer, Bestowed on her by the Council of Ephesus, Titus wrote, It is our calling to be after her Theotokos, God-bearers in the world. Because of, rather than in spite of his deep union with God, Titus was also the most human of men, one to whom people flocked in their troubles, for they knew that he would help them. He was a sympathetic listener and those who came to him received both spiritual and material help. Our love must be proverbial, he once preached. No one is to surpass us in love. Once he went to the help of a girl who had nearly ruined her life. On another occasion he was able to persuade a mentally ill student to become a voluntary patient. Until his arrest, he regularly went each Sunday morning to an old people's home to celebrate Mass as they could not afford the usual stipend. Titus had indeed made his own the words of St. Teresa of Avila, which he was to have before his eyes in his prison cell. Let nothing disturb thee, let nothing dismay thee, all things pass, God never changes, patience attains all that it strives for. He who has God finds he lacks nothing, God alone suffices. Last Days of Freedom On the 10th of May 1940, Hitler's armies invaded Holland without warning. Within a few days, the country was forced to capitulate, and slowly but inexorably, the German forces began their deliberate attempts to curtail the freedom of the people. In the course of 1937, Titus's health had begun to give way. One day he told his prior, I am afraid that there is something wrong. I can't keep standing up any more. My knees are failing me. He looked exhausted. His memory began to fail and he had spells of giddiness. The doctors diagnosed an infection of the spinal marrow. Later that year, a serious infection of the urinary tract complicated matters. Titus tried to show himself as cheerful as before 
and slowly his health over the next two years improved. From now till his death in 1942, many of these symptoms recurred, but in no way did they diminish his apostolic zeal. After the occupation of Holland, the Nazis directed their attacks against the Jews, the press and religious schools. From May 1941, no priest or religious was allowed to be head of any educational establishment, while the salaries of those who lived in religious communities was cut by 60%, making it well nigh impossible for them to carry on their schools. At the request of the Catholic Education Council in Holland, Titus travelled up and down the country in defence of Jewish children who were receiving a Catholic education. He strove to make known to the Nazis that the Church, in carrying out her mission, makes no distinction between sex, race or people. On the 31st of December 1941, Titus wrote to his brother Henry, a Franciscan, The Lord grant you joy above all. Try to live calmly and be relaxed. Have confidence in God, come what may, for he is always with you. Give yourself up quietly to his providence. On that same morning, Titus had sat in the study of the Archbishop of Utrecht, Archbishop Jan de Jong. They were discussing the order which had just been issued that the Catholic press must carry advertisements on behalf of the Nazi party. Titus was there in his capacity as national spiritual advisor to Catholic journalists a post to which he had been appointed in 1935. The issue was clearly a matter of conscience. Titus had agreed to act on behalf of the Dutch hierarchy. Archbishop de Jong wrote later, I always admired him for his courage and vision. I consider him a martyr. The mandate given to Titus was to inform the editors of the Catholic press that it was impossible for their newspapers to carry Nazi advertisements and remain Catholic publications. To that effect, he wrote them letters, intending to deliver them personally in the new year of 1942. He wrote, The hierarchy acknowledges that as long as editors and directors strive to maintain the specific Catholic character of their paper, their striving deserves respect and acknowledgement. But there is no doubt that the order which was issued a few days ago by the leading elements in the press makes the carrying out of that order a definite infringement of Catholic principles. This is the order that forces editors to accept advertisements from the National Socialist Party and which explicitly states the refusal on grounds of principle is not tolerated. The leaders are themselves hereby deliberately making an issue out of a principle. Catholic papers cannot comply. The order has not yet been made official. The papers have received the instruction via the telex. It is possible that it will not be made official. So much the better. But if it should happen, or if such advertisements as referred to in the telex instruction were placed, the directors and editors must refuse their publication if they value the Catholic character of their newspaper, even though they are threatened with a fine or suspension, or worse, with the liquidation of the paper concerned. We have reached the limit. I trust that in this matter, the Catholic newspapers will maintain the Catholic position. The next few days were crucial. Titus travelled throughout Holland, delivering his message and discussing its implications with editors and members of the hierarchy. But someone betrayed him and disclosed his mission to the German authorities. On the 7th of January 1942, the Nazi in charge of press affairs, Willy Janka, dictated a memorandum to the General Commissar, Herr Schmidt, requesting the immediate arrest of Father Brandsma, at the same time, he was listed as a candidate for a concentration camp. Unaware of the impending threat, Titus continued his travels, meeting with the Archbishop on Saturday, 10th of January. A 
A few yards from the Archbishop's house, the leaders of the Nazi party were deciding not to place advertisements in the Catholic papers, but it was too late for their decision to affect Father Bransma's fall. Titus himself became aware of his danger. The Germans are after me. They say that I am committing sabotage. They don't understand at all, but I am going to carry on. Let them arrest me. He carried on his work as usual. He had asked the Catholic editors to remain firm. He could not himself suddenly disappear. When people mentioned the danger he was in, Titus remarked, Now I'm going to get what has seldom been my lot, and what I have always wanted, a cell of my own. Now at last I shall be a real Carmelite. Strangers had already been asking for him at the Carmelite Priory in Niemingen, but he had been away. On Monday the 19th of January, Titus celebrated Mass in Amsterdam for the last time in his life in the church dedicated to St Boniface. After a visit to the Department of Education at The Hague, Titus returned to Niemingen, where he delivered his first lecture after the Christmas holidays. That evening, at about six o'clock, he was arrested by the Sikkerheits Polizei, the secret police, and spent the night in a cell at Arnhem. The following day he was taken to the prison in Scheveningen, near The Hague. A hotel in Scheveningen. Titus was to spend the next seven weeks in this prison, nicknamed the hotel by the inmates. On the 18th of February, his first letter arrived at the Priory in Niemingen and was soon circulated among his relatives and colleagues. They read, I am already at home here. I pray, I read, I write. The days are too short. I am very calm, happy and contented. His cell was bleak. Through the window above the door, he could see only the sky, although now and again a seagull passes. He was allowed to smoke and was given back his watch, even though to set it he had to guess the hour. He still had his breviary. This he opened and placed above his bed, open at the page showing the Madonna of Carmel. At my table, I have only to look a little to the right, and I have her image before me. When I am in bed, my eye catches at once the star-bearing Madonna, the hope of all Carmelites. On his desk, he placed the picture of Christ crucified and wrote out the famous words of St. Teresa, Let nothing disturb thee, and God so near and far, God is always there. He missed his Mass and Holy Communion, but knew that God was always with him. The whole attitude and happiness of Titus is well expressed in a poem he wrote in Shavingen, and which has become well known. Dear Lord, when looking up to thee, I see thy loving eyes on me. Love overflows my humble heart, knowing what faithful friend thou art. A cup of sorrow I foresee, which I accept for love of thee. The painful way I wish to go, the only way to God I know. My soul is full of peace and light, although in pain this light shines bright. For here thou keepest to thy breast, my longing heart to find their rest. Leave me here freely alone, in cell where never sunlight shone. Should no one ever speak to me, this golden silence makes me free. For though alone I have no fear, never wert thou, O Lord, so near. Sweet Jesus, please abide with me, my deepest peace I find in thee. Titus had here in Shavingen found his true vocation. Here in his solitary cell he made his last retreat. For the last time he returned to the joys of contemplation from the multifarious activities of his previous life. Beata Solitudo, Blessed Solitude I am completely at home in this little cell. I haven't been bored once. On the contrary, I am alone, yes, 
but never has the good Lord been so near to me. I could shout for joy that he has allowed himself to be found by me, without me meeting people or people meeting me. He is now my sole refuge and I feel safe and happy. I am willing to remain here always, if he will allow me. Rarely have I been so happy and contented. This happiness radiated from his face, as is testified by many who came into contact with him during this period. Apart from his breviary, Titus was allowed two other books, Jesus by Cyril Vesheva and A Life of St. Teresa of Avila by Quokman. He was himself working on a biography of Teresa, which was later published. On the evening of the 21st of January, Hardigan, the head of the secret police department at The Hague dealing with the churches, told Titus that he was being held for clarification. Many were the times that Titus himself tells us that Hardigan was always courteous. He used his own intelligence and asked his own questions, not those prepared by others. Titus was questioned about his attitude and his sabotage, as Hardigan described it. At the end of one interview, Titus stated quite clearly, When measures are taken which are irreconcilable with Catholic teaching, the Church is obliged to refute them. I am told that I am under arrest until this affair is cleared up. But one thing I must make clear, the attitude of the Dutch hierarchy is my own. He even courageously admitted to his questioner that he would act no differently if a similar situation were to arise again. In addition to these interrogations, Titus was given paper and pen and told to provide a written reply to the question, Why does the Dutch nation especially its Catholic population, oppose the NSB, the Dutch Nazi Party. He answered at length and with his usual honesty. The suppression of the religious ecclesiastical influence is not only an offence to God in relation to his creatures, but a violation of the glorious traditions of the Dutch people. Herein lies the heart of the matter. He ended his formal reply, God bless the Netherlands, God bless Germany, God grant both nations, so akin to each other in many ways, to come together in peace and unity, and to stand next to one another in recognition of God and his honour. Hardigan was under no illusions about Titus. He called him a very dangerous little man. Number 58 in the Hell of Amersfoort On the 12th of March 1942, several large police cars with canvas covers drove out of the prison gate of Schavingen. They held a hundred prisoners. Among them was Father Brandsma. That evening, the cars arrived at the gates of the concentration camp at Amersfoort near Utrecht. After being stripped naked, and kept standing in the bitter cold for hours, Titus and the other prisoners were finally issued with the old Dutch soldier's uniform with a matching cap and a pair of wooden shoes. His head was completely shaven and on his uniform was a red triangle to classify him as a political prisoner. Titus was now just one of a crowd. Number 58. There was no more questioning. For the next six weeks... Titus endured all the sufferings and humiliations of a concentration camp. The cramped conditions, freezing cold, work from eight in the morning till six at night, the cruelty of the guards, physical exhaustion, dysentery, starvation and malnutrition. It was not long before everyone knew who he was. He was to be seen in the company of the greatest variety of prisoners and had a kindly smile and a word for all. As one of the prisoners later recalled, he gave us a supernatural insight into our imprisonment. Many came to him for courage and strength. He blessed them all, 
shaking hands with them and making the sign of the cross on their hand with his thumb, for any outward mark of religion was strictly forbidden. A recent order meant that religious subjects could no longer be discussed in the camp. But on Good Friday, 3rd of April, Titus found a way of meditating with the prisoners on the Passion of Jesus. He started his talk with a piece of genuine history. The place of the 14th century writer and preacher, Hirt Hruter, in Dutch literature. In front of him were his hundred or so guests, professors, doctors, Protestant ministers, priests, lawyers and journalists, together with many of a less academic background, all dressed in the shabby soldier's uniform, suffering and half-starved. His lecture continued to develop the history of mysticism until he was led into a meditation of the Passion of Jesus, the first object of our contemplation. As he gazed on his audience, he must have been struck by the parallel between their lives and the life of Christ in the last days of his earthly pilgrimage. It was a meditation which made an indelible impression on all who listened, on those who were making up in their bodies what was lacking in the sufferings of Christ for his body, the church. As one of them recalled, quietly we went back to our places, struck by God's spirit. No one said a word. Thanks to the prisoners who escaped death, we have abundant testimonies of those days in Amersfoort. One witness remembered Titus especially. He towered above them. He made me feel that I had met a saint. At the same time, the witness stresses that Titus was not disinterested in his fate, nor insensitive. He tried not to show it, but at times he was deeply saddened not because of self-pity, but because of the knowledge constantly before him that men could do such things to one another. He never allowed his mental suffering to diminish his humour. He merely became quieter, more compassionate. Even for the bad element amongst the prisoners, he always had kind and gentle words. These difficult hours were noted by another priest prisoner, Only in very intimate conversations did his sadness reveal itself, and always in complete surrender to God. Towards Dachau On the 6th of May, the telephone rang in the prior's room at Niemingen. He was astounded to hear the voice of Father Brandsmer. Titus was back in the prison in Schavingen, where he had arrived on the 28th of April once again wearing his black clerical suit. Several times he was taken to the headquarters of the secret police and questioned by Hardigan, who asked him once again to reply in writing to the familiar question concerning the opposition of the Dutch Catholic Church to the Nazi party. Titus had been allowed to speak to the prior only to inform him that he was on his way to Dachau, where he would remain till the end of the war. At the prison, he shared a cell with two young prisoners, both of whom believed in God. They talked to each other easily and happily. They joined together in prayer, and on the Feast of the Ascension, Titus spoke to them about the gifts of the Holy Spirit. One of them later remembered, those were great moments in our lives. Titus's second stay at Shavingen lasted less than a month, On Saturday the 16th of May, the feast of St Simon Stock, for whom Titus had such a great devotion, as the saint to whom Mary offered her special protection in the form of the Carmelite scapula, he crossed the Dutch-German border and found himself at the transit camp of Cleve. Conditions here were comparatively good. The food was well cooked, though lacking in quantity. Titus admitted on one occasion that he was ravenously hungry, yet he still gave some of his food away to the Italian who shared his cell. The curate in Cleve, Ludwig Daimel, was also prison chaplain. Once again, Titus had the happiness of receiving Holy Communion, although there was no way in which he could celebrate Mass. 
It was also through the chaplain that Father Bransmer made an appeal to be released and placed in some monastery under house arrest. He based his plea on his continued ill health, which gave him periods of dizziness and loss of memory and left him deathly tired all day long. Since this was addressed to the German authorities, it was a case of special pleading. Those who knew him in Cleve stated that he was always in possession of his spiritual faculties and that his appearance was very fine and spiritualized. Outside the prison, many others were making efforts to get him released, but all to no avail. Titus was essentially a realistic man. He did not desire martyrdom or extraordinary suffering, nor, on the other hand, did he expect ecstasies. He did his best to remain alive as long as it was possible to do so, and as long as he could be of service to others. On the other hand, when God's way became clear to him, he accepted it gladly and willingly. During his first stay at Shavingen, he had expressed his point of view in this way. I suffer with joy what has to be suffered for sticking to one's principles. My vocation to the church and to the priesthood has given me so much that is wonderful that I am equally pleased to take up something that is unpleasant. So far it is not so bad, and although I don't know what is to happen, I put myself entirely in God's hands. Who shall separate me from the love of God? Dachau On Saturday the 13th of June, the hour of departure from Cleve arrived. Father Bransmer was chained and with his companions put on the transport train for the concentration camp a few miles outside Dachau in Bavaria. The journey itself took six days. It is very difficult to reconstruct what happened. It seems that the cell cars travelled through Cologne, which had just undergone a heavy bombardment, then Frankfurt, Mainz and Nuremberg. At Nuremberg, the prisoners were housed in the Turnhalle, a vast gymnasium. Someone later described it as a great receptacle of European misery. On the day after they arrived there, they were given only two slices of bread and some coffee. A single fountain stood in a corner from which hundreds of men had to drink. Barrels stood at strategic points to serve as lavatories. The stench became overpowering during the two or three days they were kept there. On the 19th of June, their train steamed into Dachau. The prisoners were handcuffed again, stripped and made to undergo the humiliating procedure of vermin control. Then, dressed in blue-grey trousers and jackets, wooden sandals and ridiculous-looking caps, they were instructed in the ways of saluting, marching and making their beds. At last, Titus, now number 30492, was led to Block 28, where the Polish priests were imprisoned. Our knowledge of the events leading to the death of Father Bransmer comes from fellow prisoners who miraculously survived Dachau. The day began at 4am with a siren call. The quicker he got dressed, the more time Titus had for making his bed in the expected manner. He was never very good at this. Then to the washroom, where he ate what little food had been saved from the previous evening, and to the roll call ground for the counting. This was an opportunity for a short whispered greeting and private prayer. Five o'clock came, and off the prisoners went to join the work squad. Titus and a hundred others were marched to the Liebhof garden, accompanied by the SS men and dogs. Here in the garden, they had to dig the heavy soil and plant medicinal herbs. They wore wooden shoes, and before long, Titus's feet showed a number of big ulcerating wounds. They worked ceaselessly, from 5.30 a.m. to 11.30 a.m. on practically empty stomachs, without rest or water. Then they were marched back to the camp for a half-hour's break, 
to eat the miserable soup with a few vegetables. After that brief respite, they were marched back to the fields where they worked till seven o'clock in the evening. On return, they again suffered the roll call, which could last for an hour, after which they collected their rations. These had to suffice for the following morning. Three and a half ounces of bread, with a little butter and a couple of potatoes. For the priests, those hated ministers of God, the day was still not ended, for very often they were forced to do an extra half hour's exercise of marching and press-ups. Finally, around nine o'clock, they were able to retire. Many prisoners died in the Liebhof, nicknamed by the prisoners the Friedhof, the cemetery. Frequently, Titus had to be helped back to the camp. Walter Thiel, the SS man who reigned supreme, was a brute of a man who cruelly ill-treated Titus and the others. Once he was seen to beat Titus in the face with his bowl, opening a wound which bled freely on Titus's emaciated face. Titus was unable to face the physical conditions of the camp, and he also seemed to lack the knack of getting out of difficult situations. He became the butt and target of the guards. Once he forgot his glasses and crept inside the block to retrieve them. Thiel discovered him and gave him a terrific blow which threw Titus to the ground where he was again struck over and over again. At last he was able to get up, helped by his Carmelite colleague, Brother Raphael. But Raphael could not always be close. Despite this cruelty, Father Bransma remained peaceful in his close union with his crucified Lord. A Polish priest recalls, Father Bransma was then in pretty bad shape, physically emaciated and weak, but he communicated a great tranquility of spirit. In January 1941, before Titus arrived, the authorities had allowed a small chapel to be built in the block occupied by German priests, and mass was offered daily. This must have been a great consolation to the other prisoners, though they were not permitted to attend. However, a secret system of distributing the consecrated hosts existed. We know that once or twice, at the evening meal, a Capuchin friar was able to pass the host, hidden between potatoes, to Titus. On one occasion, when Titus was carrying the Blessed Sacrament concealed in his spectacle case, Thiel suddenly turned on him, beat and kicked him as if he had gone mad. With his spectacle case tucked under his arm, Titus was able to crawl back to his bunk in Block 28, assisted by Brother Raphael. He waited till Thiel was out of the way, then smiling said, I knew whom I had with me. He suggested that together they should say the Adore Te and quietly blessed his Carmelite colleague. By the 16th of July, the feast of Our Lady of Mount Carmel, it was clear that Titus was completely exhausted. Nothing, however, would stop him from praying for the guards and from trying to bring them back to God and their humanity. Who knows? Perhaps something will stick, he said. He encouraged his fellow prisoners. We are here in a dark tunnel. We have to pass through it. Somewhere at the end shines the eternal light. He spoke as much for the guards in their spiritual darkness as for the prisoners. One morning, Titus stood outside his block in the drizzling rain with some companions. Seeking a place of shelter, they were beaten up by the guards. Then, we are told, the Dutch Carmelite friar, Brother Raphael, went with Titus Bransma to the prison hospital. Titus said goodbye and entered the hospital. It was a hospital in name only. Prisoners were the subject of biochemical experiments and deliberate infection with malaria. No prisoner would go there except in the last extremity. Titus remained here for only a few days. He lay on a straw mattress alone and with the minimum of care. He was disgracefully humiliated by the doctors. 
While they used his body for their own ends, Titus simply said aloud, Not my will, but thine be done. We know the end through the testimony of the nurse who was with him and whose identity has to remain a secret, although her name is known in Rome. Titus discovered that she was a Dutch Catholic and asked her how she had ended up in Dachau. I shall pray for you a lot, he told her. He gave her his rosary, at which she protested. I can no longer pray. Titus exclaimed, Well, if you can't say the first part, surely you can still say, Pray for us sinners. The other patients constantly surrounded him, and he strove to encourage them and to direct their attention to God. Twice he was able to receive Holy Communion. On the 24th of July, Titus became unconscious. On Sunday, 26th of July, at 1.50pm, the nurse gave him the fatal injection and he died at two o'clock. Three days later, his body was cremated in the camp crematorium. Beatification On the 3rd of November 1985, in St Peter's Basilica, Rome, Pope John Paul II beatified Titus Brandsma. He said of him, In the midst of the onslaught of hatred, he was able to love everybody, including his tormentors. They too are children of the good God, he said, and who knows whether something remains in them. Of course, such heroism is not something that can be improvised. Father Titus spent his whole life bringing it to maturity from the earliest experience of infancy, living in a deeply Christian family in his beloved Friesland. From the words and example of his parents, from the teaching he heard in the parish church, from the charitable activities which he experienced in the parish community, he learnt to know and to practice Christ's fundamental commandment of love for everyone, not excluding one's very enemies. Canonization. In March 2022, Pope Francis announced the canonization of Blessed Titus Brandsma to take place on Sunday, the 15th of May 2022, in St. Peter's Square. Father Titus, 80 years after his death and 37 years from his beatification, can be venerated as a saint by the entire Catholic Church. <laughs>